Hello and thank you for joining me on this revision video. During this video we are going to be covering some of the trickiest topics that could come up on the paper one exam in 2023. Now obviously this video will not cover the entirety of all the content, just some of the things that may come up that you may find more challenging. This should form part but not all of your revision um, and will not necessarily um, as I say cover everything and I will give you some more advice on that throughout the video. Now, as we go through, I've got some pieces of advice. Advice number one would be to make notes on what you are listening to and seeing on this PowerPoint slide um, on the video. Making those notes, you can make some flashcards from the notes, you can make a poster from the notes, it doesn't really matter, but I advise you do something rather than simply watching it and doing nothing. Secondly, you can listen to it just as an audio file as well, which may be useful for some of you um, if you are um, you know, out and about in a car, on a bus in the morning or something, also equally fine. So, let's get cracking then. The first section of the Paper 1 exam, Section A, is the challenges of natural hazards. And during this topic, you'll be asked all about earthquakes, volcanoes, tropical storms and climate change. Now, the first thing to point out is, very simply, if you are asked about the distribution of tectonic hazards, it generally follows the plate boundary pattern. Now on this particular map here, you can see that along these black lines, the little red dots where our volcanoes are forming. However, there are some anomalies, for example, the Hawaiian hotspot, which is caused by something different to our traditional four plate margins. So please do be aware that if there are anything that are not occurring on a plate margin, then it's likely going to be due to a hotspot in the case of volcanoes. They could also ask you for the distribution of tropical storms. And as long as you remember the tropical storms need ocean water 27 degrees or more, you should remember that they're going to form in place of tropical waters, um, so equatorial regions. So, without any further ado then. Um, last year, on the exam, they asked students to draw out uh, meanders um, and some coastal landforms as well, which three people. Now this year, it's very likely they ask you to do something similar, but with a tectonic plate boundary. Now there are four main plate boundaries, and the first one, the diagram can be seen on the screen. Now, we've got a destructive plate boundary. Now, when it comes to drawing diagrams in geography in this exam, or when it comes to explaining something, we're not in an art exam. Now, if I had spent five minutes drawing this lovely diagram here in the exam, and it was a four or six mark question, I wouldn't be hitting the top marks, because I'm only given the key areas. The best way to do any diagram in geography is to make sure they are annotated. Now, there are two main ways you can do this, and we're going to do the first way here. So, I've drawn out my diagram of a destructive plate boundary, and as you can pause and have a read through it yourself, you can see some of the key things going on. How would I write this in the exam then? Well, how I do it is I use numbers. So I've put a little number one here on my diagram and then next to it or around it, I've then referenced that number in my annotation. It's a really easy way to show the examiner where to look and it makes it really, really clear. So I started off my answer that convection currents in the mantle drag the plates towards each other. So as these convection currents go in a circular motion, they are cooling and sticking to the oceanic and continental plates and as they cool and stick towards it, um, they are dragging it down as they move back into the mantle to be reheated and up again. Where this occurs, there is friction, so we do get really small earthquakes as well um, due to these convection currents interacting with the tectonic plates. Number two, as you can see here, subduction occurs at the denser oceanic plate, moves beneath the less dense continental plate. I've underlined the keyword subduction there because that is the mark point you would get. Third, that subducted crust melts, releasing gases which make the magma explosive and cause them to rise um, up through these vents here. Four and five, well at uh, destructive plate boundaries, we do get composite volcanoes forming and those composite volcanoes form to form high magnitude eruptions. And then to finish off my annotation, we've got deep ocean trenches forming where that subduction occurs. So where that subduction occurs there, 
we actually get our really deep ocean trenches occurring in those areas. So that's how I've annotated the diagram. If you need to pause the video to make your own version or add any notes, please do so now. Next type of exam question then, which is more likely to come up this year, is explaining why earthquakes and volcanoes form at constructive plate boundaries. Now a constructive plate boundary, as you can see, is where two usually oceanic plates move in opposite directions to each other. Now for this one, the labels are still on the diagram in terms of the numbers, but I'm showing you a different way you could annotate this diagram in the exam. So this time, I've just drawn arrows. Now every single plate boundary starts with the same mark. It's all to do with these convection currents in the mantle, and in this case, they are moving the plates away from each other. Again, same as last time, as the uh, convection currents, the mantle cools and sticks to the oceanic plate. This is like a Velcro effect. It is going to create some friction. It is going to create some very small earthquakes in those areas. As we point out in this arrow here. Then I'm going to go through and explain how these volcanoes form here then. Well, it's a bit of a misconception and my diagram here doesn't really do a good job of showing it. But we don't just get a random hole forming in the middle where these two plates are moved apart. A bit like pizza dough or blue tack when you pull it apart on your fingers. As the plates move, the crust is thinned, causing mantle upwelling to occur. Where the mantle breaks through fissures, shield volcanoes are formed by subsequent lava eruptions. And a shield volcano would look really quite uh, like a cone shape, um, a flat like PE cone as it's formed by subsequent lava eruptions um, as we go forward. Next diagram, we've got a conservative plate boundary. Now this one is different because there are only earthquakes occurring at this plate boundary, no volcanoes at all. And at this plate boundary, what we have, surprise, surprise, is the same first mark point again, the convection currents in the mantle move the plates against each other and friction can cause small earthquakes in this motion. But actually, for this plate boundary, the key is that rather than moving away or towards each other, the tectonic plates are sliding past each other. So there is no real opportunity for the mantle to move the magma or the lava above ground, so we're only going to get earthquakes, no volcanoes. Now, the key, and I put this in the middle of my diagram here, the key to the reason why big earthquakes tend to form a conservative plate boundary is as they move past each other. This is not like, um, you know, kind of two slippery objects sliding past each other in a swimming pool. These are jagged rock. And as they move past each other, the stress energy builds as the plates snag and grind on one another. And that pressure builds and builds and builds until eventually the energy is too great and it is released. The plate shifts and the energy is released as a shock wave. And as those shock waves move through the Earth's crust, they create our earthquakes for us. And we can see here the focus, the exact point where the earthquake occurs. Our shock waves then move out and the epicenter is the point on the Earth's surface um, directly above the focus. And the final button label here, a great example for this one is the San Andreas Fault in California, USA, um, which you can be clearly visible, see the fault line as it is on that location. And then finally, the last diagram we've got is to explain the key features of a collision boundary. Now this one, again, has, starts with exactly the same mark points. You'll notice they're exactly the same for all four. Convection coming to the mantle, move the plates towards each other. Friction can create small earthquakes. Now the key to this one though, is if you look at the type of plate that I've labeled on the diagram here, they are both continental crust. Now because they are both continental crust, they are the same density. Oceanic crust is newer and more dense. Continental crust is slightly less dense, but because it's the same, crustal fracturing occurs rather than subduction. And where that crustal fracturing occurs, think of two cars smashing into each other, it can create earthquakes and it can also create uplift. And the uplift of that land results in the formation of fold mountains such as the Himalayas. Again, 
No volcanoes are occurring here because, similar to the conservative plate boundary, there's no opportunity for the mantle to pierce that crust above it. Um, so we're only going to get fold mountains forming in those locations. Awesome. Now, in the exam, again, there'd be more questions about your L'Aquila and Nepal 2015 case studies. There'd be more about the three Ps, predict, prepare, protect. But I'm hopefully um, you'll have a better understanding of those topics, where these tend to be a little bit trickier. Cool. On to the next section then. We've got something called global atmospheric circulation, which confuses people. All global atmospheric circulation does is it moves heat from the equator because it receives a higher amount of solar insulation. So at the equator, it's warmer. This moves heat from the equator all the way to the poles through these different cells. Now, in theory, if we did not have atmospheric circulation, the poles would be significantly colder and the equator would be significantly warmer. It acts a bit like an air conditioning system. Now, to understand this, all we have to do is look at the arrows and follow the flow of air. So at the equator, where it's really, really warm, our air is going to rise and it's going to create something called low pressure. Now, low pressure is where air rises and forms clouds. And I always remember it as kind of like opposites. If it's low pressure, it means there's high rainfall. And funnily enough, if you look directly underneath the two low pressure parts of the Hadley cell, we've got our tropical rainforests. This air enters the atmosphere, it moves across through winds, and then it cools down. And as it cools down, it sinks. And as it sinks, it creates high pressure, which again, opposite day, means low rainfall. The air falls, there's no cloud formation, so at these locations, it is significantly dry or arid. Funnily enough, if we follow this line about 30 degrees north, we find our desert regions, don't we? Um, because it is still hot, relatively close to the equator, but significantly arid. This is also why the cold regions like the Arctic and Antarctic are known as cold deserts, because they sit under the polar cell, high pressure, low rainfall, but they're obviously cold, not hot, because they're nowhere near the equator. As you follow that through, that gives you the premise of atmospheric circulation. If we apply the same knowledge then to hurricanes, something similar happens. On either side, so let's focus on this left-hand side of a diagram here. For hurricanes to form or tropical storms to form, they need ocean temperatures of 27 degrees C or more. When we get this, we get a significant low pressure cell forming. Because the ocean is so warm, because there is so much air rising, all that low pressure combined to create spiral bands of thunderstorms. Now those bands of thunderstorms get larger and larger and larger until they combine to form what is called a superstorm. These storms spin due to the Coriolis effect, which is the spinning of the Earth's crust, and the really slow trade winds that push this storm along in its direction. Now this creates the eye wall here and here, which has the largest wind speed and the largest amount of rainfall. And in the middle of the storm, because there has been so much air rising through the low pressure, air from above the storm is sucked downwards through the eye to create extreme high pressure. So again, if you were here underneath the eye, you would see clear blue skies not very windy, very, very calm. Either side, you are seeing huge wind speeds. Uh, you're gonna see storm surges, which is where the ocean is lifted up and then blown onto the land. And you're also going to see uh, high levels of rainfall as well. And that is basically the structure and formation of a tropical storm. Now, what could they ask you about? Well, our main case study is Typhoon Haiyan. They could ask you about the effects of Haiyan, the short-term and long-term effects which refer mainly to the deaths, the injuries, the long-term economic issues associated with tropical storms. Or they can ask for the immediate and long-term responses. So if you read the nine mark question, using a named example, evaluate the immediate and long-term responses to tropical storms. What's that really asking us? It's simply saying, thinking about Typhoon Haiyan, named example, 
Was the immediate or long-term response more important or effective? So, what could you talk about? Well, for your first main peel paragraph, we always want to point evidence, explain link in our nine marks and six marks questions. Um, what could you talk about? Well, immediate responses include search and rescue, food, water, temporary shelters, evacuation shelters, field hospitals being set up, roads being cleared to allow for search and rescue teams, um, but locals did complain that the response was not quick enough. Um, access was really difficult as the roads were covered in debris, which slowed the relief effort. And what about long-term responses? Well, the United Nations donated huge levels of aid to help with the country's development. Homes, road, bridges rebuilt, fishing and farming re-established. They put in new planning controls so that homes were not rebuilt in high-risk areas. More cyclone shelters are built ready for the next storm. And the long-term recovery was slow due to lack of money. And there was a lack of support to families who had lost, lost loved ones. So immediate response, what do we do straight away in the first sort of 24 hours? Long-term response, what do we do longer term? Now the long-term response is all about building back better. And you can talk about how um, new planning controls, in other words, they don't want to build new villages um, in areas that are massively prone to storm surge flooding from uh, typhoons and tropical storms. Um, a bit of evaluation then. I'd say arguably that immediate responses are the most important for reducing the social impact, such as death, but long-term are usually better for economic purposes. So long-term response is all about getting fishing and farming re-established. It's about rebuilding infrastructure like roads and bridges. So they tend to be the economic but we need that immediate response for people's well-being, for their health in particular. But I would say that both responses are heavily reliant on foreign support. And they were both really weak as well. I mean, the Philippines, the Typhoon Haiyan was a Category 5 storm, the strongest one. Hugely high magnitude. And the Philippines is not a particularly developed country either. So it didn't necessarily have the uh, money to put into prediction, protection and preparation, the three Ps which meant that the actual event was so large that the response to it was really, really challenging. But for this nine mark question, I'd go along the lines of introduce with a conclusion, appeal paragraph for the immediate responses, appeal paragraph for the long-term responses, and then you want that judgment, that evaluation. You know, was the immediate response actually very good? Well, no, it wasn't. Why wasn't it? What about the long-term response? Why wasn't it? What would you say then? Immediate, definitely more positive reducing social impact, but long-term tends to have better economic futures for a country. Okay, and then the final part of paper one, section A, is about climate change. Now, this may sound like a really obvious question, but how do we actually know that climate change is a thing? Other than your teachers telling you about it, you see it on the news every five minutes. Well, there is loads of evidence to suggest that climate change is real. Firstly, we are seeing a global temperature rise. If we map temperatures right the way back to 1880, we can see a very clear trend in temperature rise that is increasing every single year. Um, and if we extrapolate this graph to 2030, 2040, this trend would continue to rise. So global temperature rise. This also explains why like sunspot theory and volcanic eruption theory, the natural cause of climate change, aren't happening right now because we'd be able to put them into our forecast and it would go against this clear trend. There'd be anomalies in the data not explaining the full thing. What else can we do? Well, we can actually look back at tree rings. So a tree will gain a ring every single year of its existence. The closer the rings are together, the less the tree has grown, which suggests it was a dry or colder season. The longer the rings are apart suggests it was a rainy season, um, or even uh, the perfect conditions for growth, so hot and wet, basically. Scientists can look at ice cores. So what they can do is um, they can actually drill down in places like Antarctica and the Arctic Circle. They can drill down into ice sheets and they can analyse snow that's then formed into ice from hundreds of thousands of years ago. They can work out how much CO2 is in the ice, in the air, at the time that snow fell, and then they can model what the climate would have looked like. Now, the ice core analysis matches what we've seen in global temperature change, that if we go back in time, we can guess that the climate was significantly colder than it was now. 
What about things like sunspots? How do we know if they've had an impact long term? Well, this is an example of the uh, Little Ice Age, as it was called. And we actually have some really famous paintings and artwork of when the River Thames in London froze over. We can use that to inform our knowledge of how climates have changed. And then lastly, probably the most obvious one as to why we know climate change is really evidence for it, is because we are seeing rising sea levels. Um, if you go back from 1993 to 2021, you can see that sea levels are rising. That's because land ice and glaciers are melting as a result of this global temperature rise. But there are lots of different things we can use as evidence for climate change. Nextly, we've got the effects of climate change. Now, there are absolutely hundreds of effects, but I'll be level with you. The main ones are that wet places will get wetter and dry places will get drier. And if you work through that way, if dry places get drier, we're going to have more droughts, we're going to have more famines, we're going to have more food insecurity, we're going to have uh, heat stress, we're going to have uh, dehydration, hygiene related diseases as water dries up. In areas that are going to get wetter, we are going to have more flooding, we are going to have damage to infrastructure, um, etc. And then finally, because of temperature rising, our oceans are also going to warm up as well. If oceans warm up, what does that do? Well, it means that extreme weather, like um, tropical storms, could happen more frequently and could happen um, to a greater intensity. It means we could have sea level rise because the warm temperatures are melting land ice, which could lead to coastal flooding, which means we need to uh, move away from the coastlines. Loads of examples on there. Don't overthink the effects of climate change. Um, just stick with two or three obvious ones and then always chain of reasoning explain, well, who would that affect? Will it affect people? Will it affect the environment? Um, and you, you won't go far wrong in terms of the effects of climate change. A little bit harder then are the uh, response to climate change. Now, we know that our climate is changing. It's getting warmer and precipitation levels, rainfall patterns are changing. What can we do about it? We have two options. Option number one is mitigation. And mitigation is where we actually alter our practice to stop or reverse climate change. And then we have adaptation. And adaptation is where we say, well, okay, we can't stop climate change. It's too late. What can we do to change our uh, practice now so it doesn't have a big an impact, a big A impact on us in the future? So we've got a nine mark question. Managing climate change involves both reducing the causes, mitigation, and responding to change, adaptation. Do you agree? And we've got my nine mark structure that we need to do as a minimum for this question. So I'm going to start off with my conclusion. Yes, I agree that both mitigation and adaptation are important. But in my opinion, adaptation is the most important for LICs that are facing climate change now. And I'll get onto that argument in a second. So let's look at an example of mitigation. So one mitigation method is carbon capture and storage. This is being used by Drax Power Station to reduce CO2 emissions, point evidence. The technology catches CO2 from burning fuels and stores it underground. This prevents the CO2 from enhancing the greenhouse effect and causing global warming. This is vital as reducing or even reversing the effects of climate change will play a key role in reducing the long-term effects. However, it must be noted that mitigation is often expensive, so may only be an option for managing climate change in wealthier countries. So carbon capture and storage. There are two more I could think of. We've got international agreements such as COP26, where countries collectively agree to reduce their climate change, um, their, sorry, their CO2 levels. Um, and we can also look at afforestation as well and the impacts they have. But carbon capture and storage is a good one, um, although it is very expensive and it's not necessarily approved technology either. What about adaptation then? Well, there's loads and loads of things we could do. In areas, if I go back to the effects, in areas that are having rising sea levels and are having coastal flooding, 
we could adapt by building seawalls and coastal defences in areas um, where they are having, um, you know, more extreme weather. We can adapt by land use zoning, by moving people away from hazard prone areas or not building new land in those areas. For this question, I've gone for a different argument. I say, furthermore, mitigation also may not be as effective as some countries are facing the impact of climate change right now. So mitigation is on about solving it, but what if we are facing the problem today? May 2023. Low-lying islands such as Tuvalu or the Maldives are at threat of sea level rise, while the Sahel region is already suffering more intense droughts. Therefore, adaptation is needed for the human population to reduce the effects. One example is genetically modified crops. In the Sahel, these can be made to require less water for growth, reducing the chance of crop failure during a drought. This would mean that the population could improve their food security and prevent the issue of famine becoming a reality. This also highlights why adaptation is also needed as well as mitigation. And finally, I've said overall, it is clear that both strategies are needed, but the most important strategy is context specific. Mitigation is useful, but not helpful for the Sahil in the short term where adaptation is already needed. Maybe it should be HICs that take control of mitigation, allowing LICs to spend their income adapting to current changes. So to solve climate change, we have two main solutions. I recommend you have a full read through that answer now and pause the video. Um, and if there's any other queries you have on that, to have a little look and research yourself as well, because this has got quite a good chance of coming up this year, um, if I'm being honest. Maybe not as a nine, and maybe as a four or six even, um, but a good chance nonetheless. Awesome. So now we are on to section B, the living world. Now this section is significantly shorter, it's only 25 marks. You will get a nine marker, which will likely be on your two case studies, which are either the Amazon rainforest or um, the Western Desert USA. Now, the majority of the one and two mark questions you should find fairly okay. But one challenging topic that I think could cause a problem is nutrient cycling. Now, the idea is that in any ecosystem, the amount of nutrients in that ecosystem um, varies between different stores. The main store is biomass which is the living things. We have the litter layer, which is where the living things die and fall to the floor or the, 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 the floor area of that ecosystem. And then they're converted into soil and uptaken by plants. So I'll give you the example here. We have a lovely tree with buttress roots in the rainforest. That tree, unfortunately, um, has some leaves that die, which are then stored in a litter layer those litter layer components are then decomposed by decomposers into soil and then uptaken by plants again. Now you'll notice that the litter layer in the rainforest and the soil layer are really, really low. The reason why the litter layer is so low is because the biodiversity is so high, there are hundreds or even thousands of different decomposers and those different decomposers um, actually break down that material almost straight away, almost instantly into the soil. The reason why the soil is so low is because there's a huge uptake by plants. Now you'll notice that there's a few other arrows, you want to read through them at your own speed. We've got water, uh, loss in runoff, and leaching as well. So because there's super high rainfall, there's a misconception that the soil in the rainforest is really, really good. The soil in the rainforest is actually quite low in nutrients because it has to support this huge amount of biomass um, that sits above it. In contrast to that then, we then have um, the, a cold environment, a taiga or a tundra level. Now for this one here, you'll notice the same diagram slightly differently drawn. For this one, the amount in biomass is significantly lower. Um, the reason being there's lower biodiversity, there's less ideal conditions for life. There's very, very little of a soil and that's because there is a huge amount of uh, nutrients stored in that litter layer. The reason for that, it's the same reason why you put your chicken in the fridge or you put food in the freezer. In the cold environment, decomposers cannot act as quickly 
and so they cannot break down the nutrients in those branches or in those dead animals and therefore the soil has very few nutrients in it to then support life above. But the main marks are going to come from your two case studies. Now our first case study is the Amazon rainforest which encompasses Brazil, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, etc. Now, one of the things that could come up, but we have looked at previously, are the cause of deforestation. So that's things like commercial farming, that's your cattle ranching. It's things like logging. It's things like road building, for example, the Trans-Amazonian Highway in the Amazon rainforest. It's mineral extraction, energy development, um, all those different things that can cause deforestation. We've also got some significant impacts of deforestation as well. Now I've put them in green and red because some of the impacts are actually quite good. On the positive side, we can have economic development. All those minerals for uh, mineral extraction, the energy development, the logging, the commercial farming can be a huge source of income for people in the Amazon rainforest. Leads to positive multiplier effects, leads to trade improving and clear GDP growth, which then, if you follow through your chain of reasoning, can lead to significant health and education benefits for people who often are LIC or NEEs um, in the Amazon Basin. We've also then got as well soil erosion. So as the not just the trees but any of the plants are eroded, two things happen. Firstly, the roots which bind the soil together are removed and as those roots are removed, um, the soil it becomes looser and can get washed away by rainwater. There's a huge amount of rain in the rainforest. And secondly, there's less trees to intercept rainwater. Surface runoff increases and so there is more leaching of soil, which means that the land itself, you can't grow much stuff on it anymore once a deforestation has occurred. And then lastly, the main one is the contribution to climate change. In particular, trees not only take in CO2, um, but when you chop them down, they release it as well. So it's a dual whammy effect that we need trees to sequester CO2 um, as a carbon storage method. And if we lose that, then the greenhouse effect will be enhanced. We will then have global warming and climate change. But the bit that people struggle on the most with this topic is looking at how rainforests can be managed sustainably. Now, sustainable rainforest management is actually a fairly straightforward concept. All it means is sustainable uses of the rainforest are uses that allow current generations to make a living from the forest without damaging the forest for future generations to use. So minimizing the environmental costs. Now, just stopping deforestation is not sustainable. If we're in an LIC or an NEE, we want to encourage economic development. So why shouldn't they use the forest to do that? Sustainably is making sure they can continue making money and making a living, but without damaging the forest too much so that people in the future, maybe in 20, 30, 40 years time, couldn't do the same. There are three main reasons why we can do this. The first one is ecotourism, conservation and education. Ecotourism being where they build small lodges into the forest, they can then attract tourists and then that creates a positive multiplier effect for the area. It's not just the fact that you are then not chopping down the rainforest, it means that locals are still making a decent living and then can still access the development benefits. But also these ecotourist lodges often have a key role in conservation and education as well. They can educate tourists about the rainforest, they can uh, ensure that large areas of land are no longer used for chopping down trees but on instead used for tourism, big source of income. We can do selective logging. So really valuable trees like mahogany. Um, when they deforest areas of land, traditional deforestation doesn't really decide which trees they do or don't need. They just chop them all down and then pick out the ones they want to sell. Selective logging might mean that they only pick out a certain number because you can, at the end of the day, you can chop down some trees and not have a big, a big impact on the biodiversity in the area. You might also choose not to cut down younger trees that are growing, or you might choose to, uh, any rare species of tree you might avoid, for example. So again, people can still make a living off it, but we're not damaging the forest to the point of no return. And finally, is something called debt reduction. And that's basically where lots of countries have got together um, internationally, the UK, the USA, 
um, France, Spain, and they've said to places like Brazil, to places in Indonesia, to places in uh, Bolivia, if you stop deforesting the rainforest, we will reduce the amount of money you owe us that we've given you in loans and in finance in the past. And again, the Brazilian government sees this as a brilliant idea because it allows them they are reducing the amount of money they owe, so they've got more money to spend on their own people and their country, and the forests are not being destroyed at the same time. So this resulted in like literally like millions of hectares of forest are now conservation areas because countries like the, the, the UK have you know forgiven parts of the debt owed to Brazil. They can spend that money on the infrastructure they now need um, with those reduction in payments essentially. And all three things combined to make forest uh, management sustainable. And then the second or the final key part, the key tricky part um, on section B is the human threats to the fringes of hot deserts as it will be called in the exam. Now, what it's basically getting at is desertification. And desertification is the process of normal fertile land being transformed, transformed into desert, so infertile um, land with lack of soil. Now, why is this happening? Well, essentially, the reason why this is happening is twofold. On the left-hand side, we've got the physical causes. On the right-hand side, we've got the human causes. Okay, so let's look at the human causes first. The population of semi-desert areas is increasing. So more and more people are living in the fringes of hot desert more animals to feed them so they eat more vegetation more farming so removes the natural vegetation and deforestation means there's a loss in forest cover they are all doing the same thing aren't they all those three things there are reducing the amount of vegetation in the soil add in a bit of climate change which is making temperatures hotter uh, causing soils to crack and erode or adding in less rainfall which could kill vegetation it is all therefore leading to what is called the cycle of desertification so because of overgrazing because of over farming because of firewood collection and deforestation and because of climate change the amount of natural vegetation decreases there are no plants or leaves to intercept rain and soil it is left exposed it cracks and when it rains the rainwater runs over the surface of the soil rather than soaking in and this actually means that often the soil can be washed away. The soil loses fertility and structure making it harder to grow crops on natural vegetation and the cycle starts again. So we've got our human and our physical inputs to create this cycle that keeps going and keeps going and keeps going until humans can no longer use these areas. So why do we care about that? Well this could have some huge effects. If you are living in the Sahel region in particular, you might be forced to migrate to wetter areas or to refugee camps where there might be water available. We have desertification. Livestock may not be able to survive in these conditions and may die. Crops fails and this can lead to hunger, famine and also malnutrition as well. So desertification has a huge role to play um, in the dangers of living in the fringes of hot deserts. And what can they do to solve the issue then? Well, first things first, we have the use of something called a stone line. You might want to pause the video here to read through, but essentially, quite straightforward, they build these big stone lines, and what that does, and they build a little hole next to it, then when we have our rainwater, rather than all the nutrients being washed away in the rainwater, they are trapped in these sunken pits and uh, around the rocks which keeps that nutrient in the cycle and prevents um, this kind of final stage here of desertification occurring which then increases the amount of natural vegetation and improves this entire cycle here. We've also got another initiative called the Great Green Wall and what they're trying to do is actually build an 8,000 kilometre uh, natural forest directly across Africa. So directly across the Sahel region of Africa. Why would this help? Well, it all links back to this, doesn't it? If we've got forest cover, um, if we've got plants to intercept rain, to stop being exposed to hot soil, the cycle of desertification uh, reduces. And I strongly recommend you look at these cycles in some detail, maybe make some notes about them now, 
because if this comes up, um, it will be a six or nine mark question. And there we go, through the stone lines, having the Great Green War initiative as well. Okay, final topic is section C, which for us is going to be coasts and rivers. So when you get your exam paper, it will read like this. You will open up section C, physical landscapes in the UK, and you will answer two questions from the following. I've underlined question three and question four, coasts and rivers. They're the only two you need to answer. Question five on glacial formations, you do not need to answer. You can leave it completely blank. It will be on your exam paper, but you do not have to answer a single question. We have not studied glaciers. So let's have a look at coast then. So the overall coastal system starts off with erosion. Now we can have erosional landforms like cave arch, stack stump, where you've got platforms or heavens and bays formed from marine erosion. So that's like um, we have our destructive waves or hydraulic action, abrasion, attrition and solution. We can also have erosion from sub-aerial processes such as weathering, so like freeze thaw weathering, and then mass movement, rock falls, uh, rock slides, slumping, etc. Once that material has been eroded, it is then transported down the coastline. So all the material that has been eroded in the upper echelons of the coast by marine erosion and weathering is then transported by longshore drift. Now longshore drift always moves in the direction of the prevailing wind. Swash, 90 degree angle backwash, swash, 90 degree angle backwash, and it continues until the sediment moves right along the beach. Eventually, something happens, it loses energy, the coastline changes shape, that sediment is deposited in a process called deposition. Now you could get asked to talk about erosional landforms, depositional landforms, or you could get asked to explain the, the main process of transportation. All of those three things are all intrinsically linked together. The other main tricky part in terms of the overall coastal system is if they use the word sub-aerial process. Now sub-aerial processes are caused by weathering and we also have something called a mass movement as well. Now a mass movement is basically a cliff collapse. They just use fancy terms for it. So for example, where we have loads of freeze thaw weathering, so water entering cracks in rocks, expanding and breaking that rock apart. We have rock falls where bits of rocks fall and end up a scree on the bottom of a slope here. Where we have significant uh, rainfall and our high precipitation storm events, we can get slumping or mudslides. And where we have weakened rock from weathering and maybe from a storm event as well, we can also have landslides as well. Now slumping is the, probably the easiest one to recognize. It's kind of like when you slump down into your chair all the water saturates this cliff and it slowly slumps downwards um, into the bottom. A mudslide is only the top layer that falls. And like I say, a rock fall and a landslide are mainly caused by those axes of freeze thaw weathering um, and biological weathering as well, weakening the coastline and causing them to mass move downwards. Now this in combination with uh, marine erosion means there's a lot of sediment in this system that is then moved onwards. And where is it moved to? Well, if we go back to our little diagram here, let's assume we've had some mass movement. We've had a massive rock fall here because of freeze thaw weathering on this little headland here. That has then been transported via longshore drift. Now it's got a depositional landform. Now, what I've done here is I'm, doing, I'm going to do it the same way to tectonics. And I've drawn a diagram. So first things first, for any depositional land, uh, landform on the coastline, whether it's a spit, bar, um, or whatever else it could be, you're going to be talking about longshore drift. So, spits are formed when the prevailing wind blows at an angle to the coastline, resulting in longshore drift. Now, longshore drift continues happily along this coastline until around here when something happens. And what happens is the coast changes direction. Now, longshore drift doesn't stop it actually continues out into the ocean. And as it continues and is deposited, that forms what we call a spit, okay? And a spit needs a constant supply of material or be removed, and over time, the spit grows and can develop a hook 
if the wind direction changes further out. Now, this is very, very rare, but this is a river into the estuary here. If we had a significantly large spit and it joined across the headline, it would then be called a bar. But the power of the estuary here is actually stopping the spit from forming the new line, so it stops here. Then behind the spit, as you can see, we labeled here, because waves can't get past it, it creates this kind of like sheltered area where, where silt is deposited and then there's mud flats or salt marshes, essentially, on there. Okay, and then final part of this video um, is looking at rivers. Now, one of the things that can come up with the river is looking at something called a cross section. Now, a cross section looks like this diagram here on the left-hand side. If you imagine you've cut an orange in half and we're looking at it, that's a cross section of an orange. In the river, it's the same thing. So in the upper course, our cross section is typified by V-shaped valleys. The river usually occupies most of the narrow valley floor and vertical erosion creates these steep sided areas here. So very, very steep sides through vertical erosion. Um, we get huge amounts of hydraulic action and we tend to get lots of large boulders as well. There's a lot of power in that river still at the top uh, to move those large boulders. As we go down through the middle course, you'll see the cross profile has begun to widen. It's now fairly steep, but it's looking a lot wider. And that's because in addition to vertical erosion, because the gradient of the slope is reducing, because the land is getting flatter, we are also getting lateral erosion as well at the same time. There's a combination of vertical erosion and lateral erosion. Uh, we get some deposition on slip off slopes on meanders, we get some erosion as well. Um, and then finally, at the lower course of the river, they tend to be really, really wide. So again, we've got my cross section here of a really wide part of a river. Now on the lower course, we get levees and floodplains. Erosion is, is mostly lateral. You've got to these parts, of, these parts of the river here are extremely, extremely flat. And because they're so flat, um, Essentially, we're only going to get lateral erosion. I always think of like the River Mersey. When we went to the Albert Docks for our field work, you could see the Mersey um, is really, really wide, looking over to Birkenhead, looking over to the Wirral. That's because it's in the lower course of the river. It's almost at the ocean, um, and it has this wide cross profile here. Again, if they were to ask you to draw some formations, we could be drawing a waterfall in a gorge. We could be drawing a floodplain, a levee. There's loads of examples. But I'm going to go with one that's a little bit sneaky, which is a formation of a V-shaped valley. Now, hopefully based off that first explanation, a lot of you would have picked up on that first part there. So V-shaped valley um, is all formed by this vertical erosion. And whenever we mention erosion in the exam, we always want to mention what type of erosion it is as well. So don't just say it is eroded vertically, it is eroded vertically via hydraulic action, um, etc. But it is not just vertical erosion that forms a V-shaped valley because this is not a V. This is still very much like an L or an I shaped valley. We needed to form this classic V-shape. Now, in addition to the vertical erosion, we also have weathering on the sides of the valley. So these sides of the valley here are exposed to weathering, freeze-thaw weathering, which loosens the rock, before finally we get mass movement where the actual insides of those valleys collapse inwards and create uh, loads and loads of rocks in our load in our river um, in the long term. So vertical erosion, add in some weathering, mass movement of the sides down here um, creates a V-shaped valley between interlocking spurs. You'll notice there's now loads of sediment in the riverbed down here that is then transported via uh, traction, saltation, solution, and suspension to then be deposited in the lower course of the river. Again, I strongly recommend that you make some notes at this stage here um, or make a little flashcard or test yourself on this PowerPoint um, as you're going through. And then last landform um, of today before we look at hydrographs to finish are levees. Now levees are formed in the lower course of the river. I've just put a basic diagram on here, but essentially during a flood, the banks of the river burst, and as they burst, sediment is deposited 
on either side of the river, creating a new river level. And as the river gets shallower, should we say, or the, the silt uh, raises it significantly, with each flood, the levees are built up. And this is actually why we have such fertile soil around floodplains as well, because the floodplain would be like here, here, and here, because all that sediment from rocks is really high in nutrients, which means you have really good farm. That's why people build on farmland, on floodplains, sorry, around those areas. So that's a levee formation as well. And then the last thing to look at is flooding, which has not been asked any many questions about recently. Um, and essentially, we need to know that whilst it's mainly erosion that threatens people in coastal communities, flooding is the main risk on rivers. And the key to understanding flooding is the speed of surface runoff into the water. So if we imagine it raining, if it rains 100 litres of water and it then takes one minute for all 100 litres of water to enter my um, I know my, my bucket, my bucket might overflow because that water has entered very, very quickly. If, for example, I have another 100 litres of water and I drain that through a really thick sponge, so the 100 litres eventually reaches the bucket, um, but that it's taken a few hours, it may not overflow by the time I've had a chance to, to, to drain it. So the key to flooding is the speed of surface runoff into water. The faster the runoff, the more water that enters the channel causing a flood. So to stop a flood happening, we want to reduce the speed of surface runoff. But unfortunately, that's not what's happening because the amount of flooding is increasing. Now we can split this again into human and physical causes. Uh, on the human side of it, we've got deforestation. So similar to desertification, um, if we have deforestation, we have less interception of rainwater. Interception of rainwater slows down the speed in which the water enters the river channel. So therefore, with deforestation, uh, there's an increased speed of surface runoff. More water enters the channels quickly, we're going to have a flood. And we've also got urbanisation as well. Urbanisation being where humans have concreted over, building roads, building houses. They've concreted over soil. So rather than the water draining into the soil and slowly making its way back to the river, now it's got a impermeable surface and it flows really, really quickly straight into the river at a jet speed. In addition to those human causes, we've also got physical as well. So the, the, the type and the speed of the precipitation is really, really important because if we have uh, a storm where all the rain is, is dropped in a very short space of time, like the Somerset Levels 2015 flooding, 2014 flooding, sorry, we're going to have significant flooding. Um, and if the valley sides are really steep, we also see quite a lot of flooding as well. If the valley sides are flat, thinking about basic physics here, the water's going to move slower into the river, so the river's got more chance to drain and not overflow its banks. If it's got really, really steep sides of the valley, the water enters super quickly and can cause a flood event to occur. Now, last thing on this video then is we can actually see flood events on what is called a storm hydrograph. And they look really, really confusing, but actually in reality, um, it does make a bit of sense. On this hand here, you've got the precipitation, which is this bar chart here, the same as a climate graph. And on this axis here, you've got the discharge, which is the amount of water that's flowing through the river. Now the discharge is shown by this orange line here, okay? So, we have our rainfall. In this event, it's a huge rain event. It's happened over um, the course of about 24 hours, maybe a bit less, a bit less actually, about 10 hours, isn't it? Um, huge amounts of rainfall have entered that river. Now, the time between the main part of the storm and when our river flow is highest is called the lag time. Now, if the lag time is short, there is going to be a flood. If the lag time is long, there is likely not to be a flood. Now, in theory, all of this water in any river basin, any drainage basin, will enter the river regardless at some point. If you look on here, for the same amount of water, some locations actually get a very different looking hydrograph. So this one, see the lag time is very, very short between the peak discharge and the peak rainfall. 
And this one, the lag time is significantly longer there, isn't it? Between those two different uh, rainfall events. Okay, so the water enters the river, the discharge obviously increases the amount of water in the river to the reaches of point, that's when our flood event's gonna be. And then over time, we then see um, it die down again and go back to what its normal flow of the river is. Okay, so this entire event has happened in the course of 40 hours, which is under two days, isn't it really, uh, for that. And this is really, really useful. It helps us predict um, what floods are gonna look like in certain places, helps prepare for them as well. But one of the things I can ask you about is why different hydrographs have different shapes, okay? So the one on the left here in Ostwick Beck is called a flashy hydrograph, which means it's got a really, really high rising limb, a high peak discharge, and a short lag time. And on the other side, Clapham Beck, we've got that different type of hydrograph. It's got the same amount of rainfall, but it's got a significantly longer lag time significantly lower peak discharge. This one will be a very large bad flood. This one, if it flooded at all, will be very, very small, very, very minimal. Okay? So why the differences? Well, Oswich Beck could have had massive deforestation because if they've deforested the area, there will be less interception and therefore surface runoff time increases. If we look on here, it would be faster between this point here and the water entering the river, hence why we have this short lag time. On this one, you could argue there hadn't been deforestation because maybe the trees were a thing that was stopping the water entering the river quickly and increasing the lag time. It could be to do with the speed of the precipitation, but in this case, not so much. Maybe to do with agriculture or more likely, it's to do with urbanisation. Maybe in Ostrich Beck, we had significant urbanisation. Maybe it's a bigger city. Maybe it's a bigger town than Clapham Beck. Maybe they've just built a new retail park or a brand new road infrastructure system. And therefore, because it's impermeable, they have a shorter lag time and a higher peak flow as the amounts of surface runoff uh, are increasing in speed. Okay? And that means that we're going to have a flashier hydrograph. And then lastly, maybe to do with the relief around it, maybe Ostwich Beck has really steep V-shaped valley slopes, and maybe Clapham Beck has a really short gradient, reducing in that lower lag time. Okay, and all those things combine to draw as different hydrographs on a chart. But the flashier it is, the higher that peak discharge, the lower that lag time, the more likely there is to have been a flood and the more severe that flood will have been um, in the future. So that is it for my Tricky Topics video. Um, I would strongly recommend you go back to key parts of this video, make some notes, make some flashcards. And of course, this is not everything that will be on the exam, but hopefully it will give you a good insight into the bits that could cause a bit more of a problem on exam day. Any questions, let me know. Thank you.